Well, good afternoon and Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you for joining today's briefing. As of today, we have 10,276 new COVID cases reported since yesterday. We have 3,008 people currently in the hospital with it, and sadly, a total of 19,494 people who've died since this pandemic began. Before we talk about COVID, I'll update on the severe weather, weather that we've experienced across North Carolina. We know that a strong storm system moved across our state and brought high winds and flooding and down trees and power outages and snow in some areas. Statewide, we currently have 19,259 utility customers without power, but that's down from a high of 197,000 yesterday morning. And we deeply appreciate the work of first responders and utility providers to help people and to get them reconnected as quickly as possible. With freezing temperatures predicted again tonight, we can expect black ice overnight and tomorrow morning in many areas of the state. And we encourage everyone to use caution on the roads. And I particularly want to give deep condolences to the friends and family of State Highway Patrol Trooper John Horton and Mr. D Dusty Luke Beck, who were both tragically killed in a highway accident in Rutherford County last night. So as we close in on two years dealing with COVID-19, I know many of you are weary and frustrated. I know it was difficult for people who want to do the right thing to make decisions about the holidays and to have sometimes difficult conversations with family and friends about being safe. And after making so much progress against this virus, it's been stressful and sometimes scary for people to test positive or see coworkers, friends, and family members test positive now and over the holidays. Fortunately, for people who have been vaccinated, and especially for those who've gotten boosters, the new Omicron variant has been less severe than the previous surges. We have the benefit of so much more information, science, and data than we did at the start of this pandemic. And we're using that knowledge to keep students safely in the classroom, help businesses stay open, and ensure public services are running as effectively and efficiently as possible. And the way for us to get even better on all of that is to get more of us vaccinated and then boosted once we're eligible. I and my family have. And that is the strongest protection we have to fight this virus and live normal lives. Most of the people with COVID in the ICU right now are unvaccinated. There's still time for you to get a vaccine and the booster. They are free, safe, effective, and readily available for you. Studies show that boosters increase our immune response even more and provide greater protection from the Omicron variant. And we know the booster is especially important for those 65 and older and in other high-risk populations. We have more than 92% of our seniors who are 65 and older fully vaccinated, and more than 64 of them have boosters, have done boosters. And those numbers keep rising. This week, I'll extend Executive Order 224, which requires vaccinations or testing of state employees. When I extend that order, the Office of State Human Resources will have the authority to include boosters in the definition of being up to date on vaccines when the CDC takes that action. And our medical experts here and I encourage the CDC to do this as soon as possible. With these vaccines and boosters, we have an amazing tool to save people's lives and beat this pandemic and we'll keep our foot on the gas when it comes to getting more shots and more boosters administered. This virus and its variants will continue to be with us for a while, but we're getting better and better at dealing and living with it, and we'll keep doing that. And now I'd like to invite the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Cody Kensley to share an update with us. Secretary Kensley. Thank you, Governor Cooper. 
Last week, we set a single day record for COVID-19 cases. The next day, we broke it. And the next day, we broke it again, topping out at 19,620. We are not alone. The highly contagious Omicron variant of COVID-19 is setting record case numbers across the country, putting a strain on testing services and creating concern about hospital capacity. We are taking several steps guided by our laser focus on saving lives, ensuring that hospitals can provide care to people who need it and keeping kids in the classroom. The first thing on everyone's mind is testing. We set records there as well. On New Year's Eve, more than 91,000 tests were reported to the state. I know many people felt the frustration of this increase and had to endure long lines. While state testing accounts for only 10% of the testing in North Carolina, we have been using our resources to open additional testing sites and thousands of appointments each day. Before the holiday, we distributed about 500,000 test kits across the state, and we are ready to fill other requests. We are also working with our partners to ease the strain across the state. Despite the large amount of testing, the percent of tests that are positive remains high at nearly 30%, far above our target of 5%. Here's what you can do to get tested. Plan ahead. Use our Find a Test tool at ncdhhs.gov slash get tested. You may need to look at a variety of locations. And please, do not go to the emergency department to get tested. Second, I want to remind everyone that treatment is extremely limited across the country. Because supply is limited, per federal guidance, treatments will be used for those at highest risk of severe disease. And the best treatment is prevention, so get your vaccination or booster if you are eligible now. The third area we are watching is hospital capacity. As of today, 3,008 people are hospitalized with COVID-19 and 603 people are in the ICU. That's 80% of our hospital beds and 85% of our ICU beds. We are concerned both for patient care and for staffing. We are in close contact with hospital leaders to manage capacity and provide support through our patient coordination system if needed. The fast spreading Omicron variant is another reminder that viruses change and our understanding of them grows. Last week, the CDC updated its guidance for those with a COVID-19 positive test or exposure. It reduced timeframes for isolating, depending on your symptoms and vaccination status. The department has outlined our guidance to that standard and updated the Strong Schools Toolkit with those guidelines. Wearing a mask is another layer of protection against the spread of the virus. North Carolina is again in the CDC's red high transmission category. We advise you to wear a well-fitted, multi-layer mask. If possible, wear a surgical or procedure mask, a KN95 like what I'm wearing, or an N95. We are making these higher-grade masks available for adults at no cost in more places that need them, like long-term care facilities and federally qualified health centers, and for school staff and populations at higher risk of exposure for severe illness. That last group includes migrant farm workers. These organizations and others that provide essential services can request these masks online at covid19.ncdhhs.gov slash request masks. Testing and wearing a mask are essential tools in slowing the spread of COVID-19, but the bottom line is that vaccines and boosters are the number one thing you can do to protect your health. As Governor Cooper mentioned, most people in the hospital are unvaccinated. More than 87% of people in the ICU are unvaccinated. Vaccines are our way out of this. They provide the best protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And boosters are critical. Early evidence shows that boosters provide a significant level of protection against Omicron. Vaccines are available for those five and older, and boosters are available for those 16 and older. Yesterday, the FDA recommended boosters for children 12 through 15 years of age, but the CDC must still act. The CDC today did approve a third dose for certain immunocompromised children ages 5 through 11. They also shortened the time for getting a booster if you got the Pfizer vaccine to five months after your second shot. If you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please talk with a doctor, 
nurse, nurse, or other medical professional, or go to reliable online health resources like CDC or myspot.nc.gov to be sure you are getting accurate information. You can still decide to get vaccinated and help us save lives, protect hospital capacity, and keep kids in school. Thank you for that update, Secretary Kinsley. We are glad to have you at the helm, continuing the department's strong work. As you heard Secretary Kinsley's update, cases of COVID-19 are reaching all-time highs right now. Our hospitals still have capacity, and that is because so many North Carolinians have gotten vaccinated and boosted, sharply reducing their chances of needing hospital-level care. This hospital capacity is important but we know that many of our doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers are tired after two long years of this pandemic. I have executive orders in place, giving them more flexibility and support to get through this. We owe these heroes so much. And the best way to show them our appreciation is getting vaccinated and boosted so we greatly reduce the chance that they have to treat us and add to their burden. As a new year unfolds before us, I have so many reasons to be hopeful about our state's progress in dealing with this pandemic, educating our children, and growing our economy all at the same time. But we have to keep doing what works, and I know we will. Also with us today is Don Campbell, the Chief of Staff at Emergency Management, Tim Moose, Department of Public Safety, Chief Deputy Secretary of Adult Correction, and Dr. Susan Consagra, Department of Health and Human Services, Acting Senior Deputy Director of Public Health. Our sign language interpreters are Nicole Fox and David Payne, and behind the scenes, as usual, Jackie and Jasmine Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. We'll now take questions from reporters in the room, if, if you have any. Yes, sir. Hi, Governor. Michael Hyland from CBS 17. Uh, I had a few questions related to testing, and this may go to you or to Secretary Kinsley. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, one ask first, with, uh, with the weather that we had yesterday, we saw some of the sites here in Wake County that the state was working with to get open to deal with the demand. They shut down, but some of the Wake County sites did not. Why wasn't there a backup plan in place to ensure that testing could continue yesterday? Well, first, I want to thank people for doing what we ask and for doing the right thing, going and getting tested. Uh, we've had a record number of tests over the holidays, and that, that's a positive thing. And one of the things we've been doing is working with our providers to help provide more testing sites and to provide more testing for people. But I'll let Secretary Kinsley address that. Thanks for the question. Uh, you know, I think Yesterday, unfortunately, we saw some pretty rough weather, and I think in that situation, we want to, of course, prioritize safety. I know that our vendors, as of the Wake County government sites, are working hard to get everything up and running up at the top speed that they were at before, and as soon as the weather allows that, they'll be moving through to that. So I think what's also important to remember is that there are a lot of different options for testing, and so folks need to make sure they're going onto our website to try to locate those options. Um, you know, I recognize that this is frustrating during these record high moments in testing, and so we'll continue to work to increase access as much as possible. Related to that, we have seen people really struggling to find the at-home tests at the drugstores and in other places. Are you looking at doing anything else to increase the availability of testing, including opening up any more sites or getting more tests that the state could be sending to people's houses? Yeah, great question. So we continue to, to work to procure additional tests. I think it's important to remember that these tests are a national, if not international, product. And so there's a lot of supply chain issues as we're working to secure those. Um, and we did distribute many of those uh, on the eve of the uh, holiday period. And of course, now we are working to increase access point with our vendors. Uh, I am hopeful to hear from our federal partners that national lab capacity for testing remains in excess of the demand meaning there's still supply for labs. Now, those aren't the fast tests that you're referencing, but that is another product, which is why I remind folks that they're making sure that they're looking at all the options available, planning ahead, checking our website to make sure they're finding those opportunities for testing. Can you 
event that this is not the last time we see an increased demand for testing like this, say there is another surge in the future, what planning are you all doing to ensure there's not this scramble that people are going through to try to get testing done? Well, I think that we are definitely going to continue to see um, very high levels of demand as we go through uh, the next month, uh, especially in the current Omicron surge. Uh, and so, um, but I'm also really hopeful, uh, you know, we've seen the private sector in partnership with the federal government rapidly ramp up um, the availability of testing, whether that's in labs or the over-the-counter rapid tests that you've mentioned. Uh, and, and I know they'll continue to work to increase those so we can try to um, stay ahead of that demand as much as possible. About the updated executive order, um, ha have you all yet been asking the state employees who are subject to it if they've gotten the booster shot, or are you even tracking that information yet? Well, first, let me go to rapid tests. I was on the phone with the White House team today. I'm constantly asking the federal government for more resources. They let us know that two more rapid tests have been authorized by the FDA. Uh, what, 15, that would make 15 or so of them now that have been authorized by the FDA. They say that that will help put millions more tests on the market for people. Uh, in addition, uh, today was the last day of the RFP that the Biden administration put out on this half a billion uh, tests that they're gonna try to get out to, to the, the states in the next week, couple of weeks or so. So I think things are moving to try to make rapid tests better. Uh, as to the question about the executive order, first, we, we want to make sure that our state employees are vaccinated and that they are protected. And one of the things that we are seeing more and more that really being up to date on your vaccination is making sure you get boosted. Because with this Omicron variant, we're seeing so much more protection because of the, the booster ramps up the, the immune system. So when the CDC makes that decision that they're going to include boosters in their definition of up to date, this executive order authorizes our state human resources uh, department to include that as part of the requirement for state employees. Now there will be a ramp up time because we know people need time to get boosters, but already we are encouraging not only state employees, but everybody to, to get boosters because we know that with this Omicron variant, a booster is so much more important. Uh, and then particularly in prisons, I know you all have been working on an incentive program to get more of the employees vaccinated there. Will there be any kind of incentive for employees to get the booster shot? You know, we will look at those as well. We, we've seen an uptick in the number of our corrections officers who have taken us up on the, the bonus in order to get vaccinated. So we're going to continue to look at all ways to get more people vaccinated and we'll use what's most effective to get that done. Yep. Yes. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Rose Hoban from North Carolina Health News. So continuing on Michael's line of questioning about the uh, correctional system, um, do we know how many inmates have received boosters at this point? I think we're at 74%, but what I'm going to do is call Tim Moose up with uh, the Department of Corrections, well, the Adult Corrections and the Department of Public Safety. Tim? Thank you, Governor. Thank you for the leadership. Um, thank you for the question. Right now, the current uh, offender population in our facilities are at 74% fully vaccinated, 33% of those have received boosters and prisons continues a very um, in-depth vaccination program to increase those numbers each day. There's also been an additional almost 6,000 individuals who have returned to our communities that are fully vaccinated. Now, I was on the phone yesterday with your department and I was told that you can't, you don't currently have a breakdown as to who's vaccinated and who's boosted in each facility. Um, why is that the case? It's, that's a, information that isn't on our public website, but we'll certainly follow up and provide all the information that we can. Now, how do, how do inmates go about requesting a booster? Do they have to, do they just raise their hand? Do they have to report to sick bay? Do they have to, how is that, how is that process going? 
um, it's going well. They can do it through a variety of measures. They can request it um, through their case manager. They can request it through medical appointments. And then our medical staff obviously have that record information of who's already been vaccinated and they go to those individuals to inquire about the booster when they meet the criteria to receive that. And have you had um, inmates file grievances or you know uh, complaints over um, access to boosters? This is something that we've been hearing. Uh, I don't have any of that information available with me today, but we'll be glad to follow up and provide that to you. And I have a question or two for, for Cody, if I could. Hi, Rose. Hi, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I, um, you know, one of the things we're hearing is we're seeing these, you know, sky high case numbers. Our hospitalizations are definitely going up, you know, but these days, Omicron, uh, we're seeing that it's less severe, uh, ostensibly. What are the numbers that you're looking at most closely? Yeah. We are definitely focused on uh, our hospital numbers, as I, I mentioned in the remark. I mean, that is where, uh, you know, we want to make sure our hospitals are available for individuals to get care, whether that's care for the for COVID-19 infection or it's care for any other reason you would need to go to the hospital. So that's what we're watching incredibly closely. Now, with the case numbers that we're seeing being so large, if even a very small percentage of those individuals end up in the hospital all at the same time, it can create, if not for our statewide system, especially regionally, issues in hospitals. So that's why we're incredibly close contact with our hospital leaders. We're standing up our patient transfer. As Governor Cooper mentioned, keeping flexibilities in place to make sure folks can have access. We're very focused on hospital capacity. And finally, um, you know, what, what changed, are you going to be working with the state school board to change the stay in school to toolkit, you know, in, to include like a test to stay option? Thanks for the question. So um, we are uh, excited to see a research coming out of the ABC Collaborative that examined uh, a sort of modified test to stay program. Uh, you know, what we found in that research was that, you know, first and foremost, that the Strong Schools Toolkit is incredibly effective when schools follow those guidelines, including having mask requirements at reducing infection and spread and keeping kids in the classroom. Uh, we will be continuing to review that information, meeting with the school board later this week uh, to potentially implement some of that into our policy. Okay, here's one other small question. It's more of a science geek question. You know, we're seeing I indications that um, more people are testing negative but still coming down with symptoms of COVID. And then there's been some recent research showing that that Omicron may be more present in the oral cavity rather than in the nasal cavity. What do you, like, do, or, do you anticipate any change in protocol that people should be swabbing both mouth and nose or is there any discussion around that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll turn things over to Dr. Consagra to speak a bit more to this. But what I would say first is that, you know, this virus has continued to evolve rapidly and we're having to stay on top of the science and data to make sure we're staying two steps ahead of it. But Dr. Consagra. Thanks, Secretary, and thanks for the question, Rose. So what we've seen with the Omicron variant is that it is less severe, and part of the reason why that might be is because it is more likely to infect your upper respiratory tract as opposed to go deep into your lungs. So that is something that we are continuing to get more information on, see more data on. But the tests that we have right now, we are also seeing that they are effective in detecting that, and certainly as we go forward, we're going to continue to monitor that and see if there's any updates. Um, so thank you. Yes, Dawn. Hi. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, one that you'd mentioned being on the phone with the White House talking about testing, and then there's the meeting that President Biden had with the governors last week. Did you, um, any questions you had for him? Was it about testing supply? And are we looking at, you said a few weeks of people that are waiting in these long lines this week. When can they expect that to, to change as far as the testing supply here? So I know that people are frustrated, but it's because they are doing what they should do, and we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for the record number of people who have gone in to get tests. This virus is changing on us rapidly. Uh, the administration, uh, we have asked them to respond and to help us with more testing. Uh, they are doing that. We're working with our providers to provide more testing. 
uh, I feel confident that we'll get even more tests for us so that we can keep up with this. Testing is a vital part of fighting this pandemic and knowing when do you need to stay away from other people. So we're, we're going to keep asking for federal resources and keep asking for help and also working with our private sector, which is, I think, on top of this as well, uh, continuing to cre increase the testing options for people. And I'll do like Secretary Terry Kinsley says, to go to the website and check all of your options that are out there. One place may be crowded, but another place may not be as crowded. And I know that it's trouble, but I thank people out there for doing the right thing and for working so hard to get themselves tested and their family tested. And on um, the percent positivity rate is, is really high now. Is there a way to know that that is definitely Omicron and these are, these are more mild cases? Is that something that you all are looking at as a metric in the same way that you did before, or is that not as, not as much a factor? So we're always concerned about the percent positive, and particularly when it is high as it is now, almost 30 percent. Uh, you know, we want it around 5 percent. One of the things that, that we know is happening out there is that obviously there are a lot of rapid tests going on and people who get a rat, and that, that's not something that generally the state would record, people who get a positive on a rapid test would then go to get a PCR test and that might increase the positivity rate. But I'll let uh, Secretary Kinsley comment on that. <clears throat> You know, thanks for the thanks for the question. I think that an important thing to remember is that you know I, do, I don't want to downplay while there's some good science that this may be less severe. You know, what we're seeing is over 87% of the folks that are in the hospital right now, um, in the ICU in particular, are unvaccinated, and so individuals that do not have immunity still have severe risk potential here. So we look at the cases, and even if a smaller percentage of those cases end up in the hospital eventually, uh, thinking about the number of people that are unvaccinated, thinking about how quick this is moving and everybody showing up in the hospital at the same time, you know, it's still a serious risk for both those individuals and for the hospital system. Does the state, what does the state use to determine which variant hospitalized people have? Great. So, um, you know, at the state lab, we se sequence all of the positives that we have. The CDC also has a sequencing program where they collect samples of positives from labs across the country. Uh, I believe off the last forecast, uh, you know, over 80% of the sequence positives were Omicron. Uh, and forecasting for North Carolina that is rapidly turning Omicron is crowding out all the other variants. As it's safe to assume as we move forward that pretty much every positive we're seeing is Omicron. And then a question for any of you, um, you know, it, there's, or it's almost final approval able to get for the 12 to 15 boosters, but there's still this, the youngest group of children who are unvaccinated. Um, so what, what should those parents, those caregivers know as far as what they can do since they don't, they don't have any options right now? Yeah, I'll have Dr. Consagra take this. Thanks, Secretary. Uh, so, so yes, as we know, you know, we're going to hear tomorrow whether CDC is recommending boosters around five to twelve year olds. The younger age group, from six months to five months, we know there are studies happening now to look at uh, possible vaccination recommendations for that age group, and so we'll hear further. Until then, we you know have existing other tools that work, masking being one of those really important tools. It's also really important for those around children to be vaccinated. So, if you're around younger age groups, you know one of the reasons vaccine is so important is we are protecting them as well by getting ourselves vaccinated. So again, continuing to practice those layered strategies, vaccination, masking, testing, really important as we continue to protect not only our children, but other vulnerable members of our society. Thanks. And then one more for the secretary, the governor. Um, you had, I think it was Secretary Kinsley had mentioned about these, um, the K95 masks being available, but um, to potential school staff, but only upon request. Is there is that a supply issue as far as if they would be like sent to schools if they need them? And is that only staff or available to students too? What's the logistics there? Yep, thanks for the, thanks for the question. You know, because of the early work that we did in the pandemic, we have built up a significant supply of PPE, um, including uh, masks. I mean, over 14 million N95s, I believe, alone. Uh, you know, 
schools or other critical uh, you know, essential services can make that request at the website online and we'll work to provide that. Uh, you know, it will depend a bit on uh, the, vo the volume needed, but also size of masks and these sorts of things. So I think the right next step for providers or any entity that wants those masks is to go onto our website to make the request. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to the phones if we have any questions from media calling in. Media calling in. Our first question on the line is from Ashley Talley with WREL. Hi, Governor. Thank you for taking my call. Back to the testing, uh, I'm sorry, the testing supply question. Um, we've heard from several counties now, at least three, that are out of tests. They say they've requested some from the state, some is almost a week ago, and that they've not received them. Is the state low on testing kits to distribute to counties? Well, we've had a well, record had number of people to get tested, and we know it's important to do it. I'll let Secretary Kensley address that specific question. So we do have some uh, rapid testing kits in our supply, uh, and we have additional orders out, and we're waiting to hear from those suppliers when they will be delivered. And so we're working to respond to those requests uh, as quickly as we can to provide access to those tests. But again, I want to remind folks, there are more options than just the rapid tests that's available for folks to get tested. It's convenient in a lot of ways, but there are also you know, a lot of lab capacity and a lot of collection points. You know, as Governor Cooper mentioned, you know, 90% of the testing capacity is available in the private market. Looking out at pharmacies where there's free testing, all of these things you can find on our website to try different places. Next question, please. Follow up, Ashley Talley, WRAL. Sorry, just to follow up with that. Um, you said that you do have some rapid tests. Does that mean you have distributed all of the PCR tests that the state has? There are no more in reserves, is that correct? And then my other question is um, beyond a push for boosters and more testing, is there any other plan to limit the spread of the virus, whether it's a statewide mask mandate, lifting, you know, indoor gathering capacities, that sort of thing? Thank you. Thanks for the question. So it's important to remember that the PCR test is done in a laboratory. And so the collection for that test you know, is really a swab and a vial and is done out in the field and then sent to the lab. So the capacity and how that test is different than the rapid test. The state has a great deal of vials and uh, swabs and other supplies that are necessary to support testing, that's not a limiting factor. Uh, it's the collection sites in the community that we're continuing to partner with vendors and other entities to stand up more collection points. We're in constant contact with our labs who process these. They signal to us that their capacity to process these tests remains above what they're being demanded of, and so that's great. So that's how PCR tests. The rapid tests, which are the standalone, do-at-your-own-home tests that you can pick up and have come to you, uh, those tests um, we do have in short supply as we're seeing national shortages um, all over, and so we continue to work to procure more. We're excited for what the Biden administration is doing to help create more access to those and potentially directly shipping them to folks' homes. So we'll continue to, to really do everything possible, work with all of our partners to increase access. But again, I can't drive home enough how important it is to be tested. Folks are doing the right thing. They're getting the information they need. This is a particularly tumultuous time. Uh, individuals uh, pushing through that frustration to do the right thing is excellent. Uh, and then uh, I'll maybe turn things over to the governor for the other question. And we know that vaccines and boosters are our way out of this pandemic, but we're also continuing to strongly recommend masks when you're in a public place inside and for just people to use their common sense. We know so much more about this pandemic than we did before. And we're trying to use all of that knowledge and get it, get it to people. And I believe that we, we can get this virus to the endemic stage, which is what we want to do. We're going to have to learn how to live with it and continue to keep our kids in school and our businesses open and all of our government operations running effectively and efficiently. 
And we're going to do everything we can and do everything that's necessary to make sure we can do that. Next question, please. Our next question is from Katie Peralta with Axio Charlotte. Uh, good afternoon. This is Katie with Axio Charlotte. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I had a question about um, reporting of at-home tests, of at-home rapid tests. Um, other states have reporting protocols. Uh, Washington, D.C. has like a, a portal that you can go online and, and self-report your results to. Are you guys concerned about the fact that North Carolina doesn't have a system for reporting these at-home tests, whether, you know, the positive results could skew the percent positive rate as something unrealistically low right now, or conversely, maybe if we have more negative results coming in, that the percent positive rate could be something entirely different than, than what it turns out to be, um, you know, that, that nearly 30% rate. Is that something that North Carolina is looking into, having some sort of protocol for self-reporting those? I'll, I'll hand this off to Secretary Kinsley, but I will say North Carolina has one of the best systems in the country for recording our PCR tests, which of course are the most accurate tests that are collected and done in the lab. And we keep all of the demographic information about uh, what's going on out there. We, we, we have a good database for our vaccines. So when, when you're talking about these at-home tests, I think you're really going into a, a lot of tests that would be out there. I'm not sure that you could uh, collect enough accurate information for it to be meaningful, but uh, I'll let Cody see what he says about that. Thanks for the question. So I think that um, <clears throat> it's important to remember that uh, we actually do have antigen tests that are reported to us now. So with a number of providers uh, where those are where those tests are being administered in a particularly set environment, whether that's through the local health department or in schools, we have created a tool where those entities where we can trust the end-to-end -end use of those uh, tests, and as the governor mentioned, can collect the data necessary that's meaningful for us for us to take action. We are getting um, some of that information. And you can see on our dashboard where we distinguish between the PCR tests versus the antigen tests that are reported to us. Uh, and to your point, I'll, I will just emphasize further that, you know, Physicians have a responsibility to also report positives, uh, and so if someone were to have a, a positive at-home test, they were to go to the doctor with that at-home test, it's our guidance for them to treat that person as positive, support that person as necessary, and then also report it uh, to the state. So we have a number of avenues by which we can get that information uh, and make sure that we can uh, have it in a way that we can take action. Thank you. Next question, please. Our final question that will conclude today's briefing is from Michael Perchick with WTVD. Thank you uh, for your time and taking my question. I have uh, two. First, have you had any conversation with the federal government about the availability of the newly authorized oral antivirals or the monoclonal antibody treatment that has proven to be effective against Omicron? And then second, can you just please clarify who should be tested? We've heard from some doctors who are not advising asymptomatic people who may be in a close contact to go ahead and get a test just because of the uh, shortages and long lines that uh, we are seeing at some of these sites, especially in the past 48 hours uh, due to the severe weather. So if you can just clarify who should be going out and getting tested, as well as any conversations you've had with federal leaders about those newly authorized oral antivirals or monoclonal treatments. Thank you. Yeah, we know that these treatments that are out there that are effective against Omicron are in limited supply, and I have had discussions, and I know that Secretary Kinsley has had discussions with the federal government about getting as much as we can for North Carolina. We will be limited in the supplies that we get early on. I'll let Secretary Kinsley talk about that and the testing issue as well. Thanks, Governor and Secretary. So yes, you know we have been hearing and talking with the federal government around 
treatment availability in North Carolina. As the governor already mentioned, these treatments are incredibly limited in supply right now. We know certainly at the federal level they are working to increase uh, the amount of treatment courses available, but they are limited and therefore we are encouraging providers to provide them for the highest risk patients of severe disease and hospitalizations. So again, the best treatment is prevention and that is getting your vaccine. So we you know, encourage everybody, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, please get your vaccine. And certainly if you're eligible for your booster and have not gotten that, please don't wait, uh, get that now. And then as far as the uh, second question, uh, which you, you may have to repeat again, it was around, I believe, testing, but would you mind sharing that one more time? Could be getting tested. You know, there have been some doctors who said yeah. they don't believe asymptomatic people need to be getting tested. Uh, is that what's advised from the state um, or folks who are close contact, even if they do feel fine or have been exposed, should still be going ahead uh, and, and getting uh, those tests? Thanks for that clarification. So uh, just last week, we know CDC revised their quarantine and isolation guidance. And we know, as we've seen throughout this pandemic, uh, you know, guidance continues to evolve as we get more data. And that guidance right now uh, recommends that if you have been exposed to somebody with COVID-19 and you're a close contact, then you should quarantine for five days and then get a test after that five days if feasible. So that is the recommendation right now. We're still continuing to encourage that. Of course, we will see as guidance continues to evolve where those recommendations go, but that is the guidance right now. Thank you. Thank everybody for joining us today.